I'm so delighted today. I'm here in Nice on the Côte d'Azur and I'm with a lovely friend, Julia Edgeley, who's a homeopath, kinesiologist and she also does baby massage. And we actually met about nine years ago yeah. with a communal friend, Anne Naylor, who was given a chant which is called Anne I Hugh. And it was so lovely to hear a beautiful Irish accent. <laughs> That's a great memory that you remember that. <laughs> and I'm so happy to welcome you here today Thank to you Wellness so much for Spring. Me. Thank you. So, can you give the audience a little bit about your background, how you got involved in complementary therapies, and where it has led you in your life today? Well, it's led me to France. More than <laughs> I've actually travelled a lot with my job to the Middle East, to America, and um, meeting loads of different people. But how it started off was actually kind of by chance is that when I was younger I was one of those kids that medication didn't work for me and I wasn't a sickly child but I had migraines and so my mum um, had to look up more natural therapies to help me with my migraines and my headaches because painkillers didn't work and so from that it kind of led us my family into clean eating healthy eating uh, aromatherapy and when I was in my I think I was 16 and in Ireland everybody gets a summer job I, there was a health store near my where I lived and they were hiring part-time for the summer so I decided to go for the job but they thought I was 18 because I've been told it's hard to put an age on me and so they hired me and they trained me in all natural therapies and that's where I got my inspiration is like this is what I want to do. My family necessarily, my dad was always like as long as you have a degree I don't care what you do so he was very much education was very important to him so I was going to do I didn't know if I was going to do law or medicine or so I was going to, I did a start to do a basic science degree in Dublin and didn't want to do it. I was like, listen, I really want to do either acupuncture or homeopathy. And I found one college that had a degree, a science degree course, and I was allowed to go and do that. Wow. Yeah. I know especially it's the same with Wales and Ireland tradition and culture. Yes. Yes. Yeah, they yeah. would have um, probably looked down on it. Just... I think it was more, it was for security for my future. In, in Ireland, like when you have a degree, you're secure. And it, I mean, it has opened so many opportunities now. I want to do a master's, a PhD. And that was the plan initially when I graduated. But seeing patients has become my passion and that has taken over my yeah. time. <laughs> seeing more patients. And what did your mum do? Because you said she started researching into clean health and healthy living. It was all to do with um, making sure that we ate loads of vegetables, loads of fruit, like in the time of the 80s, very little sugar. Like I didn't have jam until I was about eight. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> and um, supplements, taking a cod liver oil or iron, and vitamin C, which in the 80s in Ireland, not a lot of people were aware of this, but my mum would go and get her magazines and go to the library and made sure it was all based around food. Wow. And um, then I remember one time, I don't know what happened. I had something on my foot that I was getting an infection. Again, nothing worked. So my mum, like old wise tales of making a bread poultice. I don't know if you yeah. know bread poultice. Yeah, absolutely. And she put that on me and that worked. And so she would look up every different thing because unfortunately I was one of those kids that you just couldn't give anything to. Well, I remember you mentioned cod liver oil. Every Sunday, all of us had to take a spoon of cod liver oil, yes. whether we wanted it or not. It was I like... didn't think it was that bad. Well, my mum used to try and get the orange one, but I right. just, it, didn't, it wasn't that bad for me. I could swallow it now. Oh, really? There's a few things though I can't, like the taste of it is just like, like what is it, um, wormwood against, oh. do you know the taste of it? Yeah. I took yeah. it when I was going to Thailand instead of um, for malaria because obviously I couldn't take the medication and this sounds really irresponsible to say but after three days like I'd rather have malaria. <laughs> this tastes awful but I didn't. I kept on and I took it and I'm still here. <laughs> you are and you're alive and exactly. healthy and able to tell the tale and so you've mentioned you've been to all these countries so what happened once you qualified? When I qualified I was um, I was trying to figure out what way I wanted to practice other on, on, on the internet or seeing patients and with word of mouth because where we live I am I was the only English speaking homeopath and um, I started to a lot attract the expat community and then more and more I spoke French it was the French community as well because homeopathy in France is very popular it's been a very strong foothold in France for centuries and so I I don't know if I mentioned this already, but I treat a lot of children. I love treating children. And that was the beginning of my practice. And because very few homeopaths treated children, I started to get a lot of French families. Um, how that went on then, it was writing articles on how to, like homeopathy, on online magazines that we had down here, homeopathy for hay fever, 
um, natural beauty products. That's a few years later I started to talk about the importance of swapping your products and a lady in the Middle East in Lebanon at Ede Sands Hotel, they do wellness retreats and um, Alice Ede contacted me and asked me if I wanted to, to be a speaker and a practitioner at her retreats in Lebanon. Fantastic. Yeah. And how did you go to Dubai and Thailand and all the other places? Um, Dubai, I haven't been to Dubai yet, but I've asked by a, a company to go to Dubai and do one of my Clean Your Beauty routine pop-ups in Dubai. So that is on the cards. Thailand was just a holiday because I love to work and eventually I've had a few people around me going, you need to take time off. So we took time off, went to Thailand. But for work, I also went to America and I, went, I had patients in California and there's talk as well of people asking me to do my Clean Your Beauty routine pop-ups in New York and the East Coast. Yes, this is why I mistook because earlier when we were chatting you told me yeah. next year you'd love to plan a pop-up worldwide oh, tour. Oh yes. And you mentioned Dubai and New York. Yeah, and that's on the like cards. That. Well, because people have asked me, I'm looking into seeing if I can do events, the full day event there. Oh, fantastic. And um, obviously you were doing this as a child and naturally with natural yeah. products. And yes. Where do you mainly do them now? My pop-ups? Yeah. Um, mostly they've been in France and in Ireland. And with a following that I have on Instagram, it's um, my following around the world. People are asking me to try bring the pop-ups to, to them. Because I think we were, mentioned, we were talking earlier that to swap your products, it's not necessarily straightforward. Because obviously I have the ingredients I recommend that you are aware of and potentially and possibly avoid. But things like shampoo, the transition's not easy. Yeah. Um, what's the other thing that's hard for people to find? Things like mascara or when you remove certain ingredients from your face cream, for example, your skin will change and your cleanser will change. So I kind of coach people how to do it naturally and so the transition is swift. And it's a great, it's a great opportunity, you're saying, for women to come together. There's a lunch involved and it's a great team atmosphere. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to coming to one of these days out. Hopefully I'll be able to do another one in France this year. Fantastic. Who discovered homeopathy? Um, why did you want to do homeopathy, for example? We had, we had a lecturer in our, in our university and he says, you don't choose homeopathy, homeopathy chooses you. <laughs> and it's a certain, it is a certain truth to that because everyone who studies homeopathy and practices homeopathy, it's almost by chance that comes into their life. Actually, homeopathy started in, sorry, in the 18th century. Wow. And um, by a Dr. Samuel Hahnemann. And he decided to, he was a doctor, and by translating uh, medical journals, he saw that there was chinchinoa bark um, treated malaria, because malaria at that time in Europe was quite bad. And he decided to try it, taste it, but he developed symptoms of malaria. And he was aware of the Hippocrates theory that you can cure, cure with opposites or you can cure with likes. And that's what homeopathy means similar suffering so you cure like what like meaning if you have for example a burn a burning sensation a burning cough a burning pain we would give you a substance that would make that would create that in a healthy person to then eliminate the pain the sensation and that is seven i want to say he was born in 1755 i should know this but i can't remember it came to france it very, he ended his life in in france so it's very popular here yeah, I, I know when I first came to, to live in the port of France, mm. I got recommended by one of my clients to go to a famous herbalist who, yeah. you know, the people just went there. You couldn't make an appointment and you had yeah. to wait all morning or into the afternoon even just He's to see here, them. He's still here, I think. He's actually given the business now to his son. I know, so yeah. Son. I love that place. Yeah. Love it, yeah. yeah. So people are very open to it, but I found personally, you know, when I see clients for Reiki mm. or for Psyche when they come when we ask you know what's going on in your life and are you on any medication yeah usually they've got a huge sack of medication yeah. but they say yeah but I'm doing the homeopath as well yeah yeah you yeah it's, it can be work that's thing a great thing with holistic I think with holistic therapies they can work with medication in certain cases for the patient that would be advised and then when you get the patient you boost their vitality you boost their energy they feel more in control of their health that way then they can work with their doctors to reduce certain medications and um, obviously the best is prevention trying to avoid getting to that stage yeah I know when I first had um, my first consultation with a homeopath in yeah. Australia 
I was leading a very, very busy lifestyle yeah. and um, I was losing lots of weight and they couldn't find out why I wasn't sleeping. Yeah. And for me, it was like quite intrusive, all the questions. Cause yes. they saying, you know, so why aren't you sleeping? How's your business? Yeah. How's your relationship? Yeah. And it was all about feelings and I was like, hmm, don't know how I feel. I'm too busy to stop. And exactly. And that's a symptom for us. Yes. Being kind of because it is all about the symptoms and like you said the first time people are unaware of their own bodies and I think that's the great thing about the practice when I when even just from the first consultation people then can take stock and going oh actually I didn't realize I was feeling this or I didn't realize that I was holding all the tension in my shoulders or in my knees and I think even that is that awareness is great for patients yeah and he also works on a, a mental level so mm. he really got in depth with various you questions. To, you have to know the patient's story. I always say the first consultation, I need to get your story. And then we, we and obviously I can prescribe on that. And then we get into the nitty gritty as we get to know each other. But you need to know where the patient is coming from. Because the thing, a lot of it can be, especially with stress, um, learned behavior. Learned behavior patterns that we've observed of adults when we were kids. And then as we grow older, this is just my opinion, as we grow older, we can see if these behavior patterns still serve us. Yes. And we have the choice that we can change behaviours. Well, just people are not aware yet, and that's where stress comes from. Ah, that's mm. interesting, because um, I know you do kinesiology as well. Yeah. Um, do you combine that with your treatments? I do in certain cases. My, I think down here I'm more known for the kinesiology for the food intolerance testing. Right. And there's a group when people go around in cafes where I live, and they say, well, I can't have this, I can't have that. People ask them, have you seen Julia? And they're like, yes. <laughs> so I mostly do it with food. Um, I think it's just the type of patients that I attract them with the kids and trying to rebalance yeah. good health. Uh, but I also do the whole body scan where I can test for points of weakness in the body and different xenobiotics, toxins in the body that are, might be contributing to your symptoms. And it can come up when there is emotional blockage. And you can actually test of what age the emotional blockage occurred. And that, for patients, like I said before, the, sometimes I don't even think that that was a problem. I've had amazing patients where I've said, listen, something happened to you when you're 11. And that's the thing, you know, I think that I'm psychic. I'm like, no, it's just, you're just your body telling me. And they come up with this, with this um, event that at the time they didn't think was huge, but then they look at it as a now as an adult, like, actually, that changed my life. And the awareness, then they can be proactive in overcoming it. And what is the most um, common thing people would come to you for? for? treatment. Yeah. The most common thing I'm, I think I'm known for, or is what I see quite often, is for children to avoid unnecessary antibiotics. That's my big passion. And with homeopathy, it is amazing to be able to avoid those. You have, you see the patient, you, the ch child, you boost their immune system. If they haven't had antibiotics yet, great. It's easier to avoid. If they have, you need to repair the gut. And we, we manage each, what we call in homeopathy, acutes, like coughs, colds, viruses. We manage each one with homeopathy. And each time a child gets an acute, their immune system gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So either to avoid more antibiotics or completely avoid the antibiotics. Well, it's wonderful that you're catching children. Getting in there early. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also you mentioned virus. At the moment, coronavirus yes. is uh, a big issue in our part of the world. Yeah. Is everybody ringing you up and going, Julia, what can I do to prevent? They didn't until yesterday afternoon. And um, I'll give you a funny story. I woke up this morning with um, a sore throat. But what happened was is, I'm fine, don't worry. <laughs> what happened was is we, ha we have protocols in our practice with the other practitioners of, um, so people feel safe, of washing hands, disinfecting after patients, cleaning down surfaces. But we're using a lot of essential oils. And I think we use so much essential oils that actually hurt our throat. But... Um, I have a few people talk. I actually put on my Instagram stories, which I might save into actually highlights of what people can do because there is a lot you can do. In a healthy patient, the virus is fine. It's boosting your immune system. If you think your immune system is weak, boost it with vitamin C. I mean, even I said this yesterday, the Chinese government are doing, hospitals are doing um, trials to show of IV vitamin C to reduce the severity because that's, I think people think the vitamin C will make it avoid completely, but it will just reduce the severity of it, but greatly reduce it. Um, vitamin C, vitamin D, washing your hands, making sure your hands don't touch your face. Right. Very, very simple things you can do. And if you think you are susceptible to it or have a weakness to it, just take measures. Maybe take a few days out of work or wear a mask. It's 
it depends. It's all depending on the case. But in a healthy individual, it's fine. Yeah, because I know in Nice they've cancelled the carnival at the weekend. Yes. You know, they're worried about people coming in from Milan. Mm -hmm. so yes. So I think it's creating a lot of anxiety and stress for people. And exactly. people are panicking and don't want to go out. Exactly. People are, because at the moment, people are coughing and sneezing. But it's allergy season down here. So everyone's coughing and sneezing. Yeah. So it's like, it is making a lot of panic, which obviously will have an effect on your immune system. Um, just stay healthy. Go out, get your vitamin C. And make sure it's a vitamin C without sugar and you will be fine. And wash your hands. Fantastic. Yeah. And what success stories have you got that you could tell us? What success stories do I have? Oh God, I have quite a few. I, obviously, the kids without antibiotics. That has been amazing. I love seeing that where you see a child yeah. comes in and previously they've had a really high fever. And I'm actually thinking recently of a child who had reoccurring ear infections. And they were, the doctor said, we need to operate on the child. And so I said, listen, you can avoid this operation. The, the mother was and the father were very nervous about the operation and the child had had a lot of antibiotics. And this is a very, it's a case I see time and time and time again for ear infections. I said, listen, we can do this. So we changed the child's diet. And um, this is a child that had loads of fevers. So I coached the parents around how to make the fever more effective. So it's not over a period of time. How to avoid Dolipran, when to avoid Dolipran. Um, Dolipran is to reduce fevers. And yeah, so viruses. similar to paracetamol exactly. in the UK. I couldn't remember the name yeah. of it. And so if you give um, Dolipran to a fever reoccurring, the fever will always come back and come back higher and higher, which will then weakens the child and their immune system, which is then leads to a secondary infection, such as an antibiotic. So with this child, we changed everything. We used remedies. The mother now is amazing in homeopathy. She can actually do it herself. Wow. Avoided the operation, never has a fe fever, and has never had an ear infection again. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, could you please explain what actually happens in a homeopathy consultation for the listeners? Well, like you said, we, we ask a lot of questions and it's good <laughs> that I'm quite nosy, so that makes you a good homeopath. <laughs> is, um, so you come in, I get you to sit down and I first off get your name, obviously your date of birth, where you're from, and I ask what you want treatment for because that is the main thing. I, I can see things in your case, but you mightn't be aware of it yet. And so I follow, I let you guide me. So I go into in depth of what you want treatment for, um, when things started, when your symptoms started, are you on medication currently, or, or in general are you on medication, and then I go through the patient's medical history. And going with the medical history, I don't necessarily start straight away, tell me about your parents, tell me about your childhood, but I let that story develop through the consultation. And it's about an hour and a half, wow. and then at the end of the consultation, um, we come up with a treatment plan. And then initial patients, I then asked to see you two weeks later because I'd like to see a follow-up just to kind of, because if it's a big lifestyle change, it can be overwhelming for a few patients if you're completely new to it. So two weeks later, just to make sure that everything's going well for you, to record new symptoms that can come up or re reactions to treatment. And then we gauge of how long I'd need to see you again. And, and sometimes actually after two weeks, it's fine. You don't need to come back. Oh, fantastic. Yes. And I, I know... A lot of people, mm -hmm. you're talking about antibiotics, for example, some people start taking them and then they stop halfway through the course yeah. because they feel that they're well. Yeah. Does this happen with your tips and advice? Not with my patients because I will tell them um, to finish the antibiotics. I mean, we, I, stay, I stay in contact a lot with patients. And so sometimes, um, like in winter, I'd get a, a group of texts in the morning, a group of texts in the evening. So I stay in close contact and with that patient and have the opportunity to ask me questions such as, will I stop the antibiotic? And I'm like, no, do the course of the antibiotics and we will boost the system afterwards. We'll, we'll, we'll clean up the consequence afterwards. Um, I am very, aware, I work with doctors, so I don't like chopping and changing medication. They're chemicals. So yeah. your body will react such as, for example, antidepressants, anti-anxiety yeah. tablets. I'm like, listen, there's other symptoms we can gauge a reaction from. And then when you feel stronger with your doctor, we can then change um, your medication. Yeah, what I meant in general, people yeah. are not good at sticking to things. It's like when we set oh, our right. goals for the year, yeah. and people will go on a diet. I and then <laughs> after, <laughs> after a week, they, they start to fade away yeah. and they get off it. So... In general, I think people are lazy and they start very enthusiastic. With the best of intentions. 
Yes. Exactly. So is it the same with just homeopathy and your advice and your tips? Or Well, apparently I have quite an authoritative voice. So I oh. don't know that's what I told them. It's like, okay, I'll do it. I like, I like the patient to see the results for themselves. Yeah. So when I'm doing homeopathy, they seem to be okay. They, they carry on with it. That's fine. The foods can be a bit trickier. Uh, because obviously it can be, be quite difficult and also when your body is when you've removed anything that can cause a weakness in the body your body has to readjust yeah. and so that comes to around week two or week three where you feel rotten <laughs> and I, so I warn patients about this I think when patients are warned what's going to come up it makes it easier but yeah. then after about I say listen there is there's research there is a line of thought that after six weeks you will see a difference from the foods so after six weeks like you're saying some patients saying oh can I stop but then they see the difference. They're like, oh yeah. my God, I didn't realize how much better I felt. Yeah. And so I prefer it that way. And then their their own body will guide them and then they stick with the treatment. Fantastic. But how would you help people with depression who are not on medication? Yeah. A lot of people hold on to past memories, you know, could be yes. death of someone close to them or a loss of a job and people lose their self-esteem and self-worth. I think patients who come to see me, they're obviously trying to avoid the medication. They don't want the antidepressants. And it's also important for me to say, listen, I'm not a therapist, but although homeopathy, the session can come across like therapy, like we were saying, yeah. memories come up and seeing things from a different aspect. There's a homeopath called Sankran, and he does um, homeopathy, uh, homeopathic psychology where when you're telling me how you feel, I'm replying it back to you in the same energy, the same dynamic, the same body language. Yeah. And people are like, I don't realize I feel like that. And that can awaken a lot for patients and they can feel they can have the strength to um, work through, because it's not overcome, it's working through their feelings, their thoughts, their emotions. Um, I also advise a lot of books to read and just be raising awareness of how our monkey mind, you know, the monkey mind yeah. thinks. I also then, I do look at a lot of the physical side because a lot of patients who come to see me with physical ailments, there isn't an emotional underpinning. Equally, the reverse is true. If they come with an emotional symptom, a lot of the physical sides can underpin, physical symptoms can underpin the emotions. For example, histamine intolerance, where um, traditionally, medically, they will look at histamine intolerance as chronic hives. But I've seen it in terms of insomnia, panic attacks. Um, general anxiety disorder and so I'll investigate the physical aspects as well to see if there's a hormone or something out of balance that is making it more difficult to address issues that you might need to address. And do you recommend they go for a blood test to check yes. their hormones? There's tests that I work with, there's labs I will work with in the, in the UK who know I'm a homeopath because some labs they yeah. might because of homeopathy, but these labs are great. And just getting in contact with their doctor, getting a blood test, getting screening. Sometimes standard blood tests are not the great. They're like a picture in time. It's like yeah. doing a picture instead of an IGTV on Instagram. Yeah. You'll get more from the IGTV. So, but you always start with the basis of just let's look at your blood test to see what your body's telling us. And then kinesiology actually can come into it as well because I can test different points of weakness. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And obviously you've run in a very successful business. So do you have any tips for young people or today there's so many people who are getting out of the corporate world and yes. trying to get into a new business, become an entrepreneur. How can they be successful? How should they start out? I would say we had to do, we had a course when we were doing our degree as a business plan because obviously most homeopaths work for themselves. So they gave us this little side course. I was like, I don't get a business plan, but I get it now, is that know what you want to achieve in a year, know what you want to achieve in three years and five years. Give yourself realistic times um, of what you can achieve and, and the time you need to do because if you go hell for leather, you'll run yourself into the ground. I think everyone's been there. The other thing as well is to create space. This sounds really hippie and out there, but to create space to welcome your clients because a lot of people go out there, networking is so important, going out meeting new people, getting your face out there. That's a point I'll come back to. But you're doing so much of that that you actually don't have time to see the patients. So I think it's creating days that even if you just sit in your into consultation room and just bring your energy there, that is really important. And the other aspect I was saying is get your face out there. Yeah. Um, I had somebody said to me, she was actually psychic, she goes, people want to see you, but they just don't know how to find you. And so I went out there all the time, obviously still creating space. So I have my networking days and moments in the month. But just put your name out there. There is somebody out there that you will help. Fantastic. Yeah. If there was one thing that you could do to change the world, what would that be? I don't know. Oh, let me have this. There's too many I want to do. Everyone use homeopathy. No, oh, it's, well, yeah. <laughs> um, 
I would love people to embrace compassion more. Not just for other people, but for themselves. Be a bit more gentle on themselves. Be a, and that's kind of more with slow living. Give yourself time to recoup. Listen to your body. If your body's saying you're tired, be tired. Just go to bed. Have a lot more compassion. Have compassion from other people as well. That we all come from different walks of life and we are, we are all trying to do our best. I think everyone comes from a good space. But things life, stress, tiredness, fear, uh, the media can make us disconnect from society. But I think if, if we could just embrace a bit more compassion. I think we do actually deep down, just a bit more thoughtfully. Well, not everyone, so it's good yeah. that you're wishing okay. this for the world. Yeah. As we had the chat earlier, it's about bringing awareness to people. Yeah. People, for example, I was setting up my new business, so I was running myself ragged to the ground. Yeah. And you don't realise how busy you are, yeah. and you don't have time yeah. to sit and wait for your client, etc., etc. Yeah. So it's about being present in the moment. Yeah. And when we talk about compassion, to me, being in nature and meditation, I know you're a big fan of it. Yes. How much of that do you advise your clients? At meditation, I can be the type that it's hard for me. I love it. And when I'm in the zone, I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. It's like a drug. Not that I do drugs. But it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's um, but it, I can understand if you have a certain type of brain chemistry, like I'm quite a dopamine type person. The yeah. new thing, the new project, let's do this. I need to be on the treadmill. I have to be very aware I'm like this and actively put stops in that I will stop and kind of raise my GABA and be more in the zone. When I'm on a dopamine high, descent, that's the only way I can describe it. Meditation can be quite difficult. However, I found my method is sound baths and binaural beats. And yes. so I, that's my tool that I can do to kind of calm me down and then I can go do my, my core meditation that I need to do. But I think there's a lot to do with, with breathing chanting i know we were, we were talking yeah. about the chanting music frequency these have a huge impact on patients and as you were asking earlier about anxiety and, and depression binaural beats is one thing a tool that i'll get i will recommend to my patients and Fantastic. it's simple you just have to put earphones in and listen to the music i did it once though on the train i put one on i put one on and it was supposed to just to do with general i think it was just uplifting but it was so calming that i two stops after my stop I woke up going oh my god where am I <laughs> I was so relaxed it's brilliant but yeah and then but yeah. these are the tools to get me to breathing uh, meditation that's wonderful yeah because I think it's different strokes for different folks yes it? and like you talked about culture and we all operate in different ways mm -hmm. and we've had our programming from childhood yes so it's what's feels right to be accepted and not accepted mm -hmm. and so I think you have to find what makes you tick what works for you yeah and that's the thing I think that can change actually through life because I have a few patients like okay I'm going to come back to you it's like no if it's me or somebody else because you can change practitioner you can change modality it'll be homeopathy herbalism reiki it's all it's like a river it's fluid and I think it's important as well when people say I want to get better and that's the full stop and I'll get over it like working on yourself working on your body it it's, can be fun and it's a lifelong, it's what life is about. Oh, yes. And so kind of going through that, finding what works for you, but then being embracing if you need to change it. And it can make it quite exciting. I love it when I get a patient and they're just on the cusp, like you said, they want to change their job or change something and they know they want to do it. And that's why I try to, it's like, you can do this. Absolutely, you can do this. And I'm so excited for them because I remember when I was in that space, it was terrifying. You didn't know if you're going to do right from wrong. And but you can then see the outcome from it, and you know that they're going to get there. I love that. Yeah, it, it gets you on a real high. Real Does it? Yeah. yeah. Your main thing I see you on Instagram yes. is these wonderful beauty tips and oh, health okay. tips. Yeah. How can people find you and hear more about you? For the for the beauty, we were laughing. My friend who I work with, we do the the non. I'm called the non beauty beauty blogger because, like I said, it's to change people to change their products, but I I try my best to talk about, like, you know, makeup tips. But all of this is on Instagram, because at the moment, that's all I have time for. So you'll find me as Julia Edgley on Instagram. I also have a lot of information on my website, juliaedgley.com, and my Instagram also links to my Facebook. I know I'm supposed to be doing YouTube and Pinterest and all that, but slowly, slowly. Yeah, and I, I, I'm a firm believer people will find you anyway. Yes. Oh yeah, I've had people found even for consultations. I'm like, how did you hear about me? And 
they've heard about me from Texas or from Australia or from Peru. And when people want to find you, they will, like you yeah. said. So thank you very much for giving up your precious time today. Thank you so it's been much for helping me. wonderful talking to you. Oh, it was brilliant. I absolutely loved it. I love talking to you. Thank you.